the Florida Writer Podcast, a discussion about writing and other things. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast. I'm your host, Allison Nissen, and today I am lucky enough to have with me Mike Polelli. Mike, why don't you give us a 60-second elevator pitch about who you are and what you write? Okay, Alice, I'm glad to. Uh, I'm a reborn um, novelist who was originally a, a lawyer in Chicago, civil trial lawyer, but most of my career was in legal teaching in the Chicago schools, uh, John Marshall Law School and DePaul College of Law. Um, there was a, a epiphany I had when Scott Turow gave a lecture at one of my media conferences that I directed. And um, we talked briefly about being a novelist and it inspired me because I had gone to Harvard Law School as he did. And I had experienced the same things he wrote about in 1L, which was a non-fictional work. And it really encouraged me because I thought, you know, I was there, I could have written it and I didn't. Uh, and at his direction, I began to work on a book. Actually, it started one year after uh, the Da Vinci Code came out. Uh, my book was called and is called uh, The Mithras Conspiracy. And it's kind of a Dan Brown theme in the sense that I've always been interested in history and the mysteries of history. And one of them, when I was touring Rome during my honeymoon, uh, 2004, was how so many churches were built over pagan temples devoted to Mithras, M-I-T-H-R-A-S. And I just got into it and I couldn't stop. Uh, and the result was a book that came out last year, uh, The Mithras Conspiracy, which basically concerns the followers of an ancient Roman cult, uh, neo-fascist uh, in origin, which are determined to overthrow the Italian government and raise questions that about the history of early Christianity. And this comes about when they discover two scrolls in the Villa of the Papyri located in Herculaneum, which is an actual villa. Uh, historically, uh, it was discovered in the 18th century and already some 2000 scrolls have been discovered. Uh, others are still being unearthed occasionally. And so this aroused my whole interest. And uh, I guess I belong to a group of writers that. Tom Wolf explained about an essay, I think it was the New Yorker, who are interested in the society in which they live and about the big questions of that society, such as in Bonfire of the Vanities. Uh, and so the novel really concerns itself with the role of religion. Uh, and as uh, Stephen Durfler, who wrote a, uh, a, a, re a brief uh, a, uh, praise quote, I guess you'd call it, on my website, that the history of, of religion has been a source of great evil and also a source of great good. And so my book kind of explores that. It also explores uh, the role of tolerance in society because for a hundred years, uh, at least a hundred years, Mithraism and Christianity existed side by side. And they're very similar in many respects. And that has intrigued historians as well as, as me as a novelist. Uh, I'm currently at work on another book, you might call it a conspiracy angle, uh, American Conspiracy. I mean, this latest election we have been through did not actually inspire me. I had the idea before it occurred because I taught constitutional law and I was aware of the pitfalls in the constitution relating to the election of the American president and what would happen if the election took a turn for the worst. Well, uh, in my novel, I kind of explore that uh, when a pharmaceutical uh, tycoon plans a coup against the backdoor president who's elected by Congress when there's no majority vote in the Electoral College. Uh, and um, so it's, it's kind of interesting how uh, I find often that uh, reality kind of uh, overtakes my fiction. And the Mithras conspiracy, part of it involved a Pope who resigned. I thought that's a great idea. No Pope's resigned since the Middle Ages. Lo and behold, Pope Benedict resigns. And the current uh, novel I'm working on, I have the uh, ultimate president, Dallas Taylor, who's African American. And this was long before Kamala Harris was selected by Joe Biden. So uh, that's one of the interesting things I find 
how my fiction has echoes in reality and the social milieu in which we live. I'm going to start with the idea that you became obsessed with the theory of this pagan Christian society, Mithras, right. and, and that you actually took this obsession and you put pen to paper, which is a fantastic way to handle any obsession that you have. Much healthier than, say, eating too much or drinking too much. Yeah, I think it's a good point you raise, Alice. And I find that, at least so far, that my novels... It, are a way of working out issues that I've been thinking about, about social issues or whatever. So it's, it's not, I would not be, I can't see myself as a pure science fiction novelist or someone I suppose would write a literary novel where it's all entirely introspective. Uh, yeah, I'm very concerned about social issues and um, trying to, and I guess writing the novel is a way for me to process it in some way. Uh, there's a phone ringing in the background, but we'll ignore that. <laughs> Must be my agent calling. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. I should be so lucky, huh? Uh, so is it? It's going to another phone now, or is it just a? I just turned it off. Okay. Uh, by, by the way, I am kind of a little bit on pins and needles because I did have, after a number of tries, an agent contacted me and wanted to see the first fifty pages of American Conspiracy, my current novel, and that took two to three months to get an answer to my query. And on the website, it indicates it may be another two to three months before I get the answer no or give us the whole manuscript. So uh, every time the phone rings, I think it must be the agent. So you've transitioned from being a law professor to being a novelist. What Correct. type of transition did that take? Was it, did you retire? Is that what started it? Yeah, it was, it was, I was in the process of retiring. I'd started the novel Oh, at least five years before I retired. Uh, but that, I think when they, as I said, Scott Turow, near before my retirement, a couple of years before, gave this lecture about the lawyer and the novel, the, the lawyer and literature. And just chatting afterwards, I realized that I really had to decide what I wanted to do. That I really want to do this full time. So things came together. Uh, uh, my wife uh, and I decided we wanted to move out of Chicago. We were a little too, it's getting a little too cold there. So we came to Sarasota 2011 and we've never looked back. We just love living in Sarasota. I love walking the beaches. It's a great place for writing. When I was, when I was a law professor, I'd say, well, I'll write sometime. I just don't have time. So then I moved to Sarasota and I was deprived of an excuse of not writing. But then I got involved with the social cause, renourishing the beach on Lido Key where I live. So I thought I don't have time to, to write. And then along came COVID-19. So I've been deprived of all excuses. I have nothing to do but right now. Well, that's interesting. Do you have a routine? You, like, do you get up in the morning, you write 50 pages, then you have breakfast and coffee? I, 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 I call it a rhythm rather than a routine. Uh, my general rhythm is... Uh, assuming I have the idea, I have to nourish the idea first. Typically, I go into town, have a cappuccino, make some notes, read the paper, because my ideas come from my environment. Like now, I don't know what my next book would be because I feel kind of sterile here, isolated. So my ideas come from interacting with the world. Once I've got the idea, then I you know, retire and do my writing. I generally do it in the morning. I find that that's the most uh, fertile time for me to write with a little chocolate on the side to give me some motivation, a cup of coffee. Uh, by afternoon, it's time to knock off and do something else. So the morning is the best time for me to write. Uh, it may seem odd for a, for a lawyer, law professor, but I've become much less rigid. Um, I don't follow the Ernest Hemingway theory of counting the words every day. I would just find that too chilling for me. So I have what I call a rhythm. I keep going. I mean, I, I block out the time and whatever happens in that time happens. Uh, and I don't worry about it. And then I take off and pick up where I left off the next day. I do agree with Hemingway that if you can stop at a point uh, where you know where you're going, that's always best than stopping and not knowing where the next point's going to be when you restart. Does that mean you're a pantser? 
Uh, I am. I'm sort of in between. I, I, when I, my first novel was an understandable mistake, at least for me. I started out with the left brain of the lawyer putting my outline before I wrote anything. Everything would be outlined. Roman numeral one, subcategory A and B. And so I'm far removed from that. On the other hand, I do like a sense of knowing where I'm going. So I, I'm, a kind of, I'm a pantser. I don't worry about outlines when I'm first, my first draft. What I do is I turn, I think in terms of images, something comes to me of an image or a situation. And, and I, I deal with that. And when that's done, that'll usually indicate where I go next. But I take it one, 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 uh, one uh, subway stop at a time, if you want to use a comparison, before I decide where to keep going or where I'm going. I like the idea of the subway stop. Tell me about your research. Yeah, well, that's where my prior career as a lawyer and law professor served me very well. I mean, one thing lawyers have to do is to do research and to prepare and to organize. Uh, so the research, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, there's a part of me that enjoys it because it's kind of like doing the knitting. Uh, it's something that I'm familiar with and like doing, and that was fun. And because when I was doing the Mithras conspiracy, we spent a week in Rome. Uh, I had taught a course, a summer course in Parma, Italy. So I was familiar with the general, with Italian, Italian history, ancient history, had studied classics. But we spent just one week, my wife and I, in Rome just doing things that we wanted to do related to the novel. And so I talked to an Italian archeologist. We saw some of the original sites in Mithras, underground Rome. I talked to uh, an officer in the Italian police force to find out a little bit more about how their law might differ from ours when I was writing the novel. Um, so I enjoyed that part. I enjoyed doing the research. Um, and it, but at some point, and that's just what I'm always fighting, is the, is, is the temptation to information dump, to include too much information. That's the harder part for me, not the original research. I kind of like doing that. But it's deciding a proper sense of proportion when it comes to writing the novel. Well, I understand it must have been really fun to work on the setting for your first novel. But now if we're talking about the second novel, how right. are you working on the setting for that one? That's a good point because I, I gave a, a talk earlier this, this year uh, to the Sarasota Fiction Group. And I realized talking to them that, that I'm really setting is really determined my first two novels. I think it was the setting of Rome that really kind of inspired me. And my second novel, American Conspiracy, I think not by accident, takes place in Chicago and Washington, DC. But the setting of Chicago and growing up in Chicago has heavily influenced me. Um, I, um, I just realized that there's a show on Netflix called Boss about Chicago. <laughs> and I. I watched it and I realized it really resonated. Parts of it resonated. And um, so I think setting is very important for me. In fact, I don't know that I would have had the emotional commitment to write either novel without that sense of setting to begin with. So I understand you have a connection to Martin Luther King. Can you divulge well, it? Well, it's a very obscure one, very indirect. It actually, now that I think about it, it first began when I was thinking about transitioning to writing or becoming a novelist. And I met somebody who was a researcher for a local novelist in Chicago. And we started talking about a book called Cities in Terror, about cities that have been terrorized. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't nonfiction. It was nonfiction, basically. But I thought it was just, you know, some guys getting together, having a beer. And next day I'm at my office and this researcher shows up with two two handbags of books, and he was serious. And I realized, hey, am I serious about writing or not? So we, we started this misguided venture, but part of it, it never mounted to anything, but I got so wrapped up into it, I drove down to Memphis, Tennessee, because one of the books we wanted to work on was the assassination of Martin Luther King. 
So I got very involved in it. I drove down there. I looked at the motel, studied about the history. And that was my first connection. The connection that I wasn't aware of when I wrote The Mythos Conspiracy until I got into the research was that Martin Luther King in his second year in theological seminary did a paper called uh, The Study of Mithri Mithraism and Christianity, where he was doing the same thing I did, comparison and being intrigued by the relationships between Mithraism and Christianity, that they both had a common communal meal, uh, that they both espouse some notion of salvation. And there are other similarities that historians have, to, to, have uh, disputed. But he was aware and acknowledged that there were similarities. And I thought, wow, that's a kind of interesting. You don't hear much about it. Uh, that we, you know, we, we think of him in so many different contexts, but not as, not as a inquiring, curious mind who wanted to know as much as he could about Christianity and its origin. And as he put it, if Christianity is the Atlantic Ocean, we have to be fair to acknowledge all the tributaries of other religions that have contributed to it. So that, those are my connections. That is really interesting. I find that when we, when we start to uncover the, the different layers of connections we have within the world, that it's a very small place. It is true. It is true. You, ne you never quite know what you're going to turn up in research. That's part of the fun. Mike, how can people get in touch with you? Well, uh, they can get in touch. I have a website. Um, it's the WWMJ Polelli, M-J-P-O-L-E-L-L-E.com. So uh, there's my website. It'll tell you uh, everything hopefully you want to know about the Mithras conspiracy. And I also offer a, um, the opportunity to send away, when you go to my website, and get the copy of the historical notes that I've used. My novel is similar to Dan Brown's only in the sense that I do start with certain historical facts, and some of them are disputed. But I start with the ones that are least disputed and go from there and let my imagination roam. Uh, but those historical facts based on the history of Mithraism and on the various plots against the Italian government that have occurred in modern times. Uh, we forget the, the years of lead and the assassination of uh, Prime Minister Aldo Moro in Italy. So I, I, those are the two aspects that combine in the novel. So it's not just a novel about ancient history, it's how the ancient history is used or misused to provide this, the, the, uh, the force for a neo-fascist conspiracy in modern Italy. Um, so you can get those notes free of charge. You don't have to buy the book. I'd be happy to communicate as all novelists do. I think for many of us, the communications, at least at my stage in life is more important than any purchase of the book. And now, are you ready to switch to our rapid fire questions? Okay, all set. If when was the last that. time? When was the last time you wrote a thank you note? The last time I wrote a thank you note, uh, I yesterday, yesterday, uh, my stepdaughter baked a pumpkin pie for me without the crust because a number of years ago, well, actually two or three years ago, I was on this diet fad that I was going to really lose weight. And one way is to eliminate. I love pumpkin pie, but I would eliminate the crust. So she has remembered that, unfortunately, because now I'm in the crust. So she sent me a crustless pumpkin pie yesterday, which I finished this morning. But I sent her a thank you note. Uh, on, um, I texted her. I don't usually like texting. I'm of a generation that prefers telephone calls, emails. Uh, so I texted her uh, actually yesterday evening. Do you have a hole punch in your office? A hole punch? I do. I do. I, I long. I used to have carbon paper, but I got rid of that about five, six years ago. <laughs> I have a hole punch. Carbon I paper. That. Wow, that takes me back. <laughs> yeah. It's an artifact now. <laughs> really, really. People like, of a certain not? age wouldn't know what we're talking about, right? Yeah, I have a three-hole punch. I use actually. I don't use it though for my writing. I use it more for. I guess uh, for, biz, uh, for uh, 
certain uh, business papers I have that I punch holes in to save them in a, in a notebook. It's kind of curious to use, uh, I'm just curious, do you use three hole punch in your writing in any way? <laughs> I have one. Um, I have not used it for my writing in a long time, but I have a list of tasks that I, that I do on a regular basis. And I've written them all on an index card and I've hole punched them and put them in a little ring so that I can just flip through and make sure I've done my tasks instead of having to have it written out on a piece of paper, I can just flip through it and stop when I need to. That's kind put of interesting. Note on it. I can put a sticky note on there if I have to remind myself of something. Wonderful. Yeah, it's interesting because in my current novel, uh, uh, Detective Jim Murphy of the Chicago PD always wanted to write a children's book, but he's afraid he would be laughed at. So he does it in secret. And what he has is a little, uh, a little notebook, a spiral, uh, what's it, one of those no, th uh, three ring notebook and they, they hastily writes notes in. So it's kind of interesting you would mention that because I, I, I do mention the three ring notebook in my novel. That's great. <laughs> and finally, do you have a favorite place to sit in your house? A favorite place to sit when I'm writing or not writing or does it matter? Doesn't matter. Uh, the favorite place to sit, I guess, I guess it would have to be where I am now in my, right here on my desk, because some of my most pleasurable moments are when the writing's going well and the flow is there. It's not always there, but if you wait and it comes, it's just very satisfying and I enjoy it. I suppose that is. Now there's the television, uh, that's, I, I guess, for vegging out or whatever, but it doesn't give me the pleasure that, uh, that this favorite place does when the writing's going well. Well, Mike Polele, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you, Allison. Have a good day. You all have been listening to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. Allison out. of the Mithras Conspiracy. He goes by the name MJ. The Mithras Conspiracy is a history-based novel. This debut novel was the 2020 finalist in the World Palm Literary Awards and the Eric Hoffer Book Awards. It also received this year an honor medallion from Indy Bragg, a graduate of Harvard Law School. Mike is a former civil litigator and emeritus professor of law from the University of Illinois Chicago John Marshall Law School. For the last nine years, he's been a resident of Sarasota, Florida. For more information about Mike, visit him at mjpolele.com. For more information on the Florida Writers Association, visit us on the web at floridawriters.com.